all have situations in life where we have trouble. Latest trouble a couple of weeks back the students had was when they got the board exam marks, right? You all didn't get marks as much as you expected, right? Big trouble, am I right? <laughs> in all of our minds, it's a big trouble. Some of you got more than expected, some of you got less than expected, but many of you went through that tough situation. Many of the students didn't go through that tough situation, but the parents went through the tough situations, am I right? Amen, yes, some hands going up there. So we all go through tough situations in life, and we, have, we face issues. Maybe it's a loss of a loved one. Last couple of weeks, I've been hearing of so many deaths. We heard about Ricky who passed away. Uh, a pastor and his two daughters who passed away in uh, Thiruvella, Rani. Uh, many people like that, you know, we were passing away like this young age, uh, un unforeseen circumstances. So when you go through a situation like people losing jobs, there are people who are losing jobs nowadays because of the economic situations. Sickness is happening. What do you do in times of despair? In times of trouble like this, what do you do? How do you face situations in life when you go through tough situations. What if, because of your faith, you are being in trouble? What if somebody accuses you of a Christian and puts you down? What are you going to do? Fortunately, in the place that we work now, we don't face that. But in many places, let's say in India or in some countries, where they, you, you are persecuted because of your faith. If you say you're a Christian, you are tagged. You're not good enough. You're put down. You are attacked because of your faith. Many churches are being attacked now. When you are in a situation like that, what do you do? Peter has some insights and we are going to look into that. Apostle Peter was a man of faith. Right? He was, a, he was a leader of the leaders. He was a one who really stood for the faith. He did some blunder mistakes, yet Jesus Christ said, on this rock I will build my church. So there are some things that he said to the because, see, most of the New Testament, we read about Paul, right? We, re we study so much about Romans and Corinthians and all that. But now I want to study about Peter, the man who saw Christ firsthand, one-to-one. -one. What is his view? How does he face challenges in life? And why is he writing this letter to the church, which we call as the First, Peter, First Peter's epistle? Let's look into the scriptures. This, is, this letter, when he's writing to the church... He's sending it through a messenger called Silovanos. That is from 1 Peter 5.12. Um, Silovanos is a trusted, a faithful brother, which Peter regards him. He have written briefly, I have written briefly to you, exhorting and declaring that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. So, Peter is writing this letter, gave it to Silovanos, Silovanos, and said, Brother, take this letter to the many churches, and we're going to read which other churches, Cappadocia and, and all that stuff. Go there, and you know, many people in those days are not literate. So you take this letter, he goes to that place, let's say in Cappadocia, and he reads the letter out. And then he goes, he has to take this letter to the next town, which Peter has mentioned, and then he reads the letter out there. And then he goes to the next town. So this letter is written for the church, not unlike for Galatians was written only for the people of Galatia or Corinthians was written for the people of Corinth, Peter is writing to a general body of Christ. And what is he writing? And why is he writing? We're going to see that. So let's pick up from 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 1. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 1. It says like this, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia. These are the towns, the places where Peter has told um, Silovanos to take this letter and read. And these are all home churches in those days, at that time. So what is this elect exiles? Peter is writing to the elect exiles. Elect is nothing but the selected, the chosen one. We are God's chosen we are God's chosen people. And Peter's right into that. How do we know we are God's chosen people? Let's look at the Old Testament, what God talks about chosen people. Exodus 19, verses 3 to 6. Exodus 19, 3 to 6. It reads like this. While Moses went up with God, went up to God, the Lord called to him out of the mountain saying, Thus, shall, thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, 
and tell the people of Israel, you yourself have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on angels' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, I, if you will indeed obey my voice, keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all people, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be with me, you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. So the children of Israel who are selected by God, they are the elect of God. And what is the description for being a chosen from God? In verse 5 it says, If you obey my voice, keep my commandments, you shall be my treasured possession among all the people. And that was in the Old Testament. And see in the New Testament we see the invitation is given to all through Jesus Christ. Anybody who believes in Jesus Christ will become. Jesus himself said, many are called but few are chosen. The calling is to everybody. But if you accept Jesus, then you are chosen by God as his children, as his elect. So we are the elect chosen of God. So Peter is writing to a body like this in those days. And we can understand some, glean some truth from what he has written in the scriptures. <coughs> Going back to the first verse. First Peter chapter 1 verse 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion. So what is exiles of the dispersion? Exile. It is like a pilgrim or a person out of his own hometown. When Peter is writing this, there are Jews in the church too. And they know and they can remember or relate to the fact of being in exile because their forefathers were in exile in Babylon before this. Of the Jews themselves were thrown out of Jerusalem, just when Peter is writing. Exile, in Babylonian exile. Children of God were there. So when he is writing this letter to the church, the Jews can understand and relate to it of how their forefathers were in exile too. But from the exile in Babylon, the children were brought back to the Holy Land. So in that context, Peter is writing this letter. Uh, there is a predicament on the scriptures. In the scriptures, that Paul is, where Peter is writing. It, it's like two sides he's mentioning. It's like an oxymoron, you know. He's saying one thing, he's like, you are dead, but you have life. You know, that's words like that. So you, you're going to see a relationship, a contrast between two situations as we read through First Peter. Two situations contrasting each other. And he, Peter talks about in 1 Peter 5.30, in the last, towards the end of the uh, book of 1 Peter, he says, So who, he is at Babylon, who is likewise chosen, send you greetings, so does Mark, my son. Who is at Babylon? So Paul, Peter is, uh, when, he's, when you read this letter in those days, if you were in the first century church, who has the uh, early history of the Holy Land, of the people there, you will understand clearly what message Peter is conveying here. Like from Babylon, you were in exile. Similar to that, you are in exile now, and I'm writing this to encourage you. So that's what Peter, Peter is talking about here. So the contrast you will see in the scriptures uh, where Peter is bringing out, it's like an oxymoronic statement. You know, like, um, uh, it, you, you are dead to sin, but you are alive in Jesus, right? So there is a death and a life together in the scripture. Uh, you are bound in this world, but you are set free. See, it's, it's an oxymoron. Uh, you, are in, you are in the world, but not of the world. You live here, but you don't belong here. You are rejected by the world, but you are accepted by Christ. See, this contrast you are going to see in the scriptures when you read First Peter, where Peter is bringing this contrast through two situations in the life. So it says, 1 Peter 1, 1 says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect in the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. So what happened? How did this dispersion happen? What makes Peter write about this exile, the dispersion, and relates to the Babylonian time? What happened during those times? Well, actually, what happened is, around 1,958 years before today, on July 19th, in Rome, a big fire broke out. The Great Fire of Rome. If you Google it, you can see it. 
This fire of Rome happened exactly on July 19th, 19, uh, AD, 50, AD 64. That's when the fire broke out. There is a lot of theory as to how the fire broke out in Rome. Nobody knows for sure. But the saying goes that Nero, the emperor at that time, wanted to expand his palace, expand his territory. So because of that, he arranged and set fire to the Rome so that things will get destroyed and he can expand his palatial buildings and the way he wants. That's the saying goes. But when Nero was about to be found out, he blamed it on the Christians and the Jews. He said, it is this Christians, this group of people called Christians or the Jews who are the one who are creating this problem. And they were creating a havoc there. Havoc means havoc as belief for people. Many people are coming to know Jesus. The movement is catching on like wildfire. And so he blamed the Christians for this fire that happened in Rome. So in AD 64, Christians, Jews were kicked out of the place. And when they were kicked out from Rome, they went to these, they were dispersed to these places. Which are the places? Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. These are the places they went. See, imagine this situation. You have a home, you have a house to stay, and now your home is destroyed by the fire. You planned so much to have a house. You saved up money. You built a house, but now that house is in ruins. It's only dust. You, you, you saved up for many things, but you lost it. And in those days, around seven districts in Rome got fire. Only four districts were saved, approximately something like that. A quarter of the city was saved, but the rest of it was fire. Six days, the city continued in fire. It took six days for the people to put it down. The moment they put it down, the next day, the fire has erupted again for another three days. And the town was three-fourths destroyed in those days. And who is to blame on this? The Christians. You and I, people like you and I. Who build a life in the town, who build a life in that place, but now your houses are ruined and then the blame comes on you. You are responsible for this. So they had to leave. Everybody had to leave. Some people are put in prison. The others fled to these places. So you as a Christian, you're a believer in Christ and you were blamed for this, which is not your fault. And you're in trouble. And you go to these places. People are starting to lose faith. People are like, what's happening? Why is this happening to me, God? What did we do wrong? We didn't do anything wrong. We are not the one who set the fire. Why are you blaming us? Why are we blamed for us? God, are you there? People are trying to question. And it is in this time of despair and trouble, Peter says, let me write to this church. Let me write to these believers. Let me write to them and encourage them how to stand strong in your faith. And that's what is Peter is doing here. And we're going to glean some topics here. Today we're going to see about what Peter talks about hope. The main point today is about hope. We all have homes in Kerala, right? Um, a family who went on vacation from our church, I was just talking to, they said they took, they're actually opening up their home after uh, three years because they didn't go because of the COVID. They're going there after three years. Imagine if your home is locked up for three years. When you go into your home, what happens? When you open, the, first of all, when you open the door, one, one sound comes like that because all the hinges are uh, rusted and you have cobwebs. You have things falling down, lizards, cockroaches, all kinds of insects. They took two days, hired a cleaning company, and it took two days for them to clean up the house. Two days to clean up the house. So I asked, how are you all doing? He said, right now the bulldozers are outside taking out all the weeds. They hired bulldozers to remove all the weeds around the house because it was so overgrown like a forest. That is how the situation is. A, a home that you built, but you never stayed, you locked it up, and it's all in ruins. You know, switch is not working, a short circuit, you had to repair. Everything. Well, I remember once when we locked up a house like that, when we opened up like that, you know, we found a lot of insects and like that. So my father did is you put all his net and the mesh and cover up everything. So the next time we went on vacation, we found, we opened, we didn't see any insects, but we found some smell of a dead animal, you know, dead thing. We found that one of the toilets was a dead rat. So how did the rat come inside? Everything is sealed. We found out later that the rat ate up the drainage pipe from outside and crept in through that. 
And to eat the rat, then a snake would have also come inside. Because snakes follow the rats also. So think, whatever you build, whatever you do, it goes into ruins. And a situation like that here, uh, in Rome, where everything that you build, all your dreams that you build, are suddenly in ruins. And you are now questioning where is God in all this? How can I deal with situations like this? Paul is writing to them and saying, in the times of trouble, read this. And let's go to first, uh, uh, Paul is talking about in First Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 to 5, we'll read, a hope that is preserved, hope that is preserved. Let's pick up from verse 3, First Peter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Amen? Uh, inheritance. Peter is reminding the believers, guys, you are the elect, the selected ones of God. Okay? And he says... According to his great, verse 3, according to his great mercy, he has caused you to be born again to a living hope that through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And the hope leads you to what? Peter is telling, the hope is leading you to inheritance, which is, what are the qualities of inheritance here in the verse 4? It says, to inheritance which is un imperishable, unfading or undefiled, undefiled and unfading. Kept in heaven for you. Who's, who's keeping this inheritance? Who's keeping this inheritance? God. God is keeping this inheritance. Can you imagine that? God is taking care of your house which is in heaven. We put security guys to take care of house when you lock it up and go, right? Put security. This gurkha wala are there. Right? You put security guys. But our inheritance is in heaven taken care of by God. And it's in heaven for you. So Peter is now reminding the church, guys, see, remember the despair they're in. They have lost all their belongings. They are in a foreign land now, a foreigner. All what could they gather in the suitcases, handbags, whatever, I don't know, in those days, it probably would be sacks and donkeys or whatever. Carry all this to a foreign land. You don't know where you're going. You've got to settle. You've got to start up again. And Peter's right, reminding them, remember, you have a great inheritance in heaven which God has kept. What Peter is trying to say is don't look back at Rome. Don't look at the destructions of Rome, at the fire that happened. Don't look back at that. But rather focus on the inheritance that you have where? In heaven. In heaven, the inheritance we have. And what is the inheritance? In verse 4 it says, the inheritance that is imperishable. You know what is inheritance? Inheritance is something you gets handed down to you through your fathers or your forefathers. You know, it can be property, it can be gold, it can be money, anything valuable. Anything that comes down from your previous generation onto you. So you are the legal owners or the heirs of those material things. But Peter is here reminding you, you have an inheritance. Come on, tell to your neighbor, check your inheritance. <laughs> you have an inheritance. Can you imagine that? You already have. Jesus said, I'm going to prepare a place for you, a home for you, right? So you, you have an inheritance. You have a home ready there. Am I right? So Peter's reminding, guys, remember, there is a home for us in heaven. And the home for us there is like a beautiful home, streets of gold. You don't need air conditions. There is no humid weather, no hot weather. Pastor, no need of AC. Only here we struggle for AC. There, no need of AC. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful... Ah, it's like sitting in a hot place like this and imagining the beautiful breeze flowing in the nice, um, of course, there will not be sunset and sunrise, but you know, imagine if going to the beach and the beautiful waves moving, the sound of the sea, the birds chirping around. Oh, paradise. You know, you call, people call this paradise in this world, a tropical, beautiful climate and all that. You know, but imagine that that inheritance for us, something like that, kept for us in heaven. And this inheritance is, first of all, Peter says, it's imperishable, means it cannot get spoiled. It cannot decay, it cannot death. Like I told you, in the house when we went, we found dead rats, dead insects. A lot of things dead. All over the floor, it is the poop of the lizards. You have seen that? Lizard poops all over the place, on the table, lights, everything got poop of lizards. Lizards were having a feast there. The, but 
the inheritance that we have is a place which is imperishable. It will not decay. That's what it means. It will not decay. It will not die. It will not get spoiled. A home that is, wow, that is so beautiful. Because every time people from Gulf, Gulf, Gulfers, when you go back to India, you'll spend a couple of rack rupees cleaning the place, painting the place, repairing everything. Then it's time to shut it up and come back here. Right? That's what people do if it is not inhabited. You spend a lot of money in that. So in order not to spend so much money, you give it for rent when you're not there, right? And then there is another problem. When you give it for rent, what happens? Those guys will spoil it. Then it's again a problem. You'll have to spend money again. So whatever you do, whatever inheritance you have here, that inheritance is, it decays. It is perishable. But Peter is telling to the church, guys, don't look back at Rome. Look at heaven. Look at the inheritance that you have there. You, I have, God has kept for us imperishable in inheritance, number one. Number two, it is undefiled, which means it will not stain or blemish. It will not get spoiled. It Morally, it doesn't get blemished. It is pure. It is pure stuff. It will stay pure. And then it says, it is unfading. It doesn't fade. The glitter, the, the, the glamour of it will not go. You don't have to use Santur soap when you go to heaven. Your glamour, you don't have to use dove cream, the face whiteners, you know, imami or something. People use all that, not to whiten your face. <laughs> People do all that. You don't have to use all that. Your, your glamour will not go. Your inheritance glamour. Uh, this time when I went, I went for a, just to buy a wedding ring because the last one I lost it. So, <laughs> so I bought another wedding ring. So one of the questions we asked the sales lady there is, uh, we can use it for daily use, right? And she said, yeah, you can use it for daily use. Normal fading only. And one month down, it's already faded. <laughs> you know? Then imagine that, normal fading. Which means even the costly jewels that you buy, it will fade. It's going to fade. But Peter is saying, remember, you have an inheritance in heaven, which is not going to fade. The glamour is not going to go. It's going to be shining. It's going to be precious. All for eternity. Yeah. And that is our hope. That inheritance which we look forward to in heaven is the hope that we're going to bank upon, is the hope that we're going to have. We're going to, that Peter is saying, rely on that. Think of that. Think of those things. And it will be a blessing for you. You'll be able to withstand the oppressions and the difficult times that you go through in this world around us. In the early church, there was a, um, there was a sign, you know, when these people had to disperse out to live in different cities, they used to be in hiding many places. So in order to show yourself that you are a Christian or a believer, they used to have certain signs and symbols. One of it is like the fish. Have you seen the fish? Many people have fish stickers in the car. That was a sign to show that this house has a Christian in it. The Jews used to have, the, they, they used to have it on the doorpost. I forgot the name of it. Uh, anyway. So fish was a sign for the Christian. Another symbol which the Christians use is a crossed fingers. You know, like this? Crossed fingers. So if you cross your fingers like this, you're just like showing the cross. So when you're talking to people, when you're relating to people, when you hold your hands like this, you're, you're indirectly showing them or telling them that you're a believer. You can do like this. Cross like this. <laughs> okay. So this was, this was a sign the early Christians used to show that we are a believer, I'm a Christian. Because they, used to, they had to be in hiding, they'll be persecuted otherwise. You could not openly call yourself as a Christian. So they used to have signs and symbols like that. This signs of change has gone back. Now people do this cross for what? If you put a cross and put your hand at the back, which means what? <laughs> You're not telling the truth, right? So, if it's, and then, <laughs> ah, I did all this. <laughs> like that, you know? This one. Another time you, people use nowadays to use this is for what? Oh, please, 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 let it be, let it be. Your bingo game is going on. 12, 12, 13, 13, ah! <laughs> and then people like that. People use the signs, and they're hoping, it's a wishful hope. Um, the, there was an air crash, uh, U.S. Air Flight 427, in 1994, which crashed in, I think it's in uh, Pittsburgh. From Chicago to Pittsburgh, it was going. And before it landed, it crashed in a field just before the runway. And all the people died, 132 people died. Investigations were going on, and a lot of investigation. It took a lot of time. And there was one of these uh, 
police officers who were collecting body parts. Because after the crash, you don't find bodies in full. You find pieces of bodies. You find a leg here and a hand there. You know, it's, it's a very tough situation. So one of the uh, officers who were collecting the, uh, the board, bo body parts, his name is Russ Shidio. He was asked by some news agents, what is the worst scene you have seen when you're collecting these body parts? He said, of all the things I've seen, he said, I still remember a hand which I found with a crossed finger like this. And probably what happened is just before the crash, that person was, you know, wishfully hoping that the plane won't crash or to hold like this. The world today is hoping for something wishfully. But the scripture tells us, as Peter reminds the church there at that time in Rome, not to look back at Rome, but remember the inheritance that we have in the future. The inheritance which God has kept for us. Amen? Come on, tell your neighbor, I have a great inheritance. Great inheritance. Amen? So this inheritance has been preserved, a hope that is preserved for us. Amen? And then Peter continues, the hope which is proven for us, a hope that is proven for us, and it's proven through time. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 to 9. 1 Peter chapter 1, 6 to 9. He says like this, In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you will be grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Verse 8, Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. So how do we know that you have that hope of inheritance? How do you know that? I will know the hope of that you have the hope in inheritance by the word you speak. If I see rejoicing and happiness in you, then I know that you believe in that inheritance. That's what Peter is talking about. And that is how the hope that we have is proven. That is, just like gold is tested by fire, even though gold is tested by fire and impurities is found, and by the way, gold will perish after some time. If you go to the Dead Sea with gold, let me tell you, it will corrode away. Because the salt in the Dead Sea will eat up the copper in those jewels that you have. So if you, before going to the Dead Sea, you have to remove all your jewels. Okay? So even this will corrode away. It will all go. But even if gold is tested by fire with purity, your faith is tested by situations like this. Maybe your house is burned down, but your faith will become stronger. See that situation which Peter is bringing out here. Two situations. You have an inheritance which is burned and gone, but you have an inheritance which is in the future, which is unperishable, undefiled. You still have that. So Peter is bringing this contrast in our lives. And he says, remember that. So this is what is important. Let joy come out of our hearts when we go through tough situations. It's not like a wishful thinking. Ah, if it happens, it happens. Some people are like that. Okay, you forgot the past. Rome is in the past. You forgot about it. Now what's the future? Ah, it'll happen. It'll happen. If it happens, it'll happen. No, that is not hope. We have, should have the hope. Our, the Holy Spirit will confirm to us in our hearts of the future hope that we have. Of the fact that the plans of God for us are for us to prosper. Not for us to fail. The plans for us. By the way, this you read the scriptures here, you'll see God foreknew this. God foreknew this. That's what Peter starts with this. By the foreknowledge of God. God knows it. God knew it doesn't mean God created it. By the way, God didn't create the fire. Nero did it or whoever did it. God didn't create the fire. But God knew the fire would happen. But God took care of things after that for the children also. God took care of it. Even if the destruction happens, even if trouble happens, Peter is reminding the church now, guys, focus on the inheritance that you have. Let praise come out of our hearts. Can you tell to your neighbor and say, it's okay, da. <laughs> Pat them and say, it's okay. 
If somebody loses the job, what do you say? It's okay. <laughs> if you fail in your exams, parents will say, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> <clears throat> so if you can rejoice through these times of trouble, then I know that you have your sure inheritance. You have sure about your hope of that inheritance that is in store for us. Because no matter what happens, I know that I have a place in heaven for us, for me. I know my family has a place in heaven. You know, sometimes when you go through this, uh, you know, this Instagram, you see, you know, uh, since I like, uh, I'm an architect and I, you know, I got Instagram, you see a lot of architecture buildings. So you see these buildings, uh, it says, uh, fancy houses in Dubai for sale. Then you'll see fancy house in Kerala. And you'll see people spending two crores, three crores on flats and, you know, houses. And you see this on YouTube and Instagram. And I'm looking at this and say, I don't have a house, you know. Uh, you think, and then one time when I was thinking like this, the Holy Spirit reminded me, I've prepared a good one for you. I've prepared a good one for you. And it's not made of bricks and mortar and, mortar and paint and all. It's made of gold. It's made with precious metals, jewels. I've got one prepared for you. And that is the hope of inheritance that we have. A hope. And we rejoice in that. So no matter what happens in our life, if you, if you lose your job, it's okay, da. It's okay. God will provide another one for us. God is the one. If God took take care of all these Christians in Rome, in Cappadocia, you know, if you go to Cappadocia, this is a beautiful place. I haven't been, but I've seen so many. It's a UN heritage site where homes are made of volcanic eruptions. Homes are made. Where homes are carved out of these eruptions. And the churches are carved out of these places too. If you go, you can see churches built from there. And it was churches built with hiding places so that you can survive for days and months inside that. And that's because of the persecution that was happening to the Christians. People survived. Even in spite of all that problems they had, the persecutions that they had, they still kept their faith. They looked forward for that future inheritance which God has kept forever. So let us rejoice. The hope that was uh, the, the hope that is proved and now the hope that is predicted. This thing which God, which Peter is reminding them was something predicted long time back. That's what Peter is saying in verses 10 to 11. First Peter 1, 10 to 11. Concerning the salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was, that was to be yours, searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what, hap what, persons of, what person or time the Spirit of Christ is with them, was indicating when he predicted the suffering of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves but to you in the things that you now have announced, have now been announced to you through, the, through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. So what Paul is saying, Peter is saying here is, these were things the great scholars the great rabbis were looking and studying. But that grace which has been revealed to you guys, and you guys believe it, and you have that, and you have that inheritance. So this was something which was prophesied long time back. This proven, this hope that we have was prophesied long time back. And Peter is reminding them, guys, hold on to that. Peter is saying, you guys, most of the believers at that time didn't see Jesus. But Peter saw Jesus. And Peter is saying, I have seen him, but you guys are believing without seeing. Because you, just like you guys, just like all of you sitting here, you believe Jesus not because you saw Jesus. You believe in Jesus because of the faith you have. And that faith is confirmed by the Holy Spirit that lives in us. That Jesus was really there. He came, he died, he lived here, he died and he rose again. And he, because he rose again, I am going to rise up again one day from death. And I'm going to live in eternity. That is the Holy Spirit conviction in us. And that is a blessing that we believed without even seeing Jesus. Jesus himself said in John 20 verse 29, he said, uh, Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet you have believed. Amen? So if you sitting here have believed in Jesus without seeing him, you are blessed. Amen? You're already blessed. 
Just by the fact that you believe, you're already blessed. Come on, tell your neighbor, I'm blessed. I'm blessed. I don't know about you, but I'm blessed. I think you're blessed too, right? If you're sitting here, then I think you're blessed too, right? I'm blessed. The fact that I know Jesus and I believe in Jesus, I'm blessed. Anybody here unblessed? Anybody here praying for blessings? That's a wrong prayer. You're praying for blessings? Anybody here? It's already, you're already blessed. You, you've been given everything that is required. You're already blessed. Now just work in that. Use that, okay? So you're already blessed. So if you were in those days in Cappadocia or uh, these places, what, you, what would you be thinking about? It is very normal for you to be thinking about the homes that were destroyed in Rome, right? Peter says, start. So in our day-to-day -day lives, what are we thinking mostly about? How much time do we think about things that we lost or we may lose? How much time do we spend? Uh, if, if Johnny studies like this, he is going to fail. If he is going to fail, then he has to do this. He will not get this admission. And we, I think like this, you know. We think and think of things which are negative, which are bad. And we spend most of the time, of course, we have to think about how you study and all that stuff. If I lose my job, what are you going to do? So I have to save so much money. Yes, yeah, saving is good. But is our thinking always on losing a job? Is our thinking and our planning only about losing job? We have to think, we have to plan. God has given us ability. But is it only that we are thinking about? What are we thinking about most of the time? Are we thinking about the world around us now? Or are you thinking about the world and the future. How much time do we spend? Check yourself. That the eight hours you have, let's say eight hours, 24 hours you have, forget about all the, when you're at work or when you're sleeping, balance eight hours. What do you do? Exclude sleeping, exclude work or studies, school. Balance eight hours. What do you time, what time, what do you spend the time with? Thinking about what? Doing what? Anything about this world now or is it about the future? Just get the proportion. Is it, if I ask you, I mean the eight hours, is it one is to eight spiritual to worldly? Or is it two is to eight, two hours spiritual things, godly things, hopeful things, and six hours worldly things? Or is it zero and eight? How is our mental state now? But I think Peter is writing a very valuable statement for us. Think of the hope that is there for us. Of a hope of inheritance that will not perish. You know, if you start thinking, you will be daydreaming, I'm sure. Wow, it's a beautiful home. God has prepared for me. And Revelation has a glimpse of it. If you start thinking about it, God, he, he loves you so much that he's taken care of everything even after your death. He's the only one who's taken care of things after your death. Think about those things. Is it complaining that is coming out of your mouth most of the time? Or is it rejoicing that is coming out of your mouth? Don't ask your neighbor. <laughs> He'll tell you the truth. Let rejoicing be out of our mouth so that it proves our inheritance. So, hope preserved, which is our inheritance. Hope proven, which is rejoicing, and then hope that is predicted. It is a prophecy. These are the three characters of the hope which Paul, uh, Peter is bringing out here. So what are some of the ways, practical ways you can, as a pilgrim, let's say you are a migrant, and I, I, all of you are migrants in this land, all of you are, it's a work, for work, uh, what is it, labor intense market or whatever you see, you say, you all have come here for work here, so what are things that you can do? Or what would you normally do if you are in such pilgrim set of situations or a temporary place in this earth? What do you do? One of the keys I would say is you will not invest in some things that you have to leave behind here, would you? Would you invest in a land here? If you are going to be thrown out of this land, would you invest in land here? You probably will not. You probably will not invest in things, costly things, that you have to leave here and go. Because eventually you have to leave and go. 
So spend less money on temporary things. Spend less on temporary things. That is one key we can take from here. Think of the things that is imperishable. What can we do that? Then how much time do we spend? Spend time on things that, are, that doesn't perish. Spend time on love. There is joy, love, which are imperishable. Spend time on that instead of H&M shirts or American Eagle jeans. I mean, you need American Eagle jeans, of course. I love American Eagle jeans and all that. But, you know, spend more time on things that will not tear. Uh, last, uh, this time on vacation, I, we were having, I was with one of my friends having lunch in a restaurant, and a nice waiter came to serve us. Very pleasant looking guy, but he's not from Kerala. And you know, this, uh, the, there's a lot of migrant workers in Kerala now. Like in <laughs> Kuwait, we have a lot of migrants from India. The same way in Kerala, there are migrant laborers. Are there. Most of the waiters in most of the restaurants in Kerala now are from the Northeast or some place like that. But this guy looked very strange. He is not from the Northeast, he's somewhere in North. So we, my friend took up a conversation with him, asked him, uh, what's your name? He said, my name is John. Where are you from? I'm from UK. John, from UK. But you don't look like you're from UK. Not John Kuryakos, <laughs> you know. I'm John from UK. We were surprised. What do you mean UK? He said, Uttarakhand. <laughs> I'm John from Uttarakhand. <laughs> you know? Because he, that's a new state, of course. I never knew. When we were studying social studies, there was only 22 states. Now there are, I don't know, we keep multiplying. <laughs> okay. So, very, very pleasant guy. But can you imagine if John decides, a very nice guy, a migrant worker here, imagine he goes to a shop and says, I want a 52-inch TV for my uh, for my bed space so I can watch a beautiful movie. Would he do that? He would not do that. He would rather watch a movie on a mobile phone and sp spend money to buy a 52-inch TV back home in UK. Whichever UK that is. I would he would rather do that. That's more wise, right? Isn't it wise that he spends money in, in, for a TV in his place in UK rather than spend in his, you know, wherever the apartment is or the bed space is probably up on the roof of the restaurant. Being wise, spending money and time on things that are eternal more than on things that will get, that will get perished here. So Matthew 6, Jesus said this, very important. Matthew 6, 90 to 20. It says, this is the words of Jesus. Do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth. Ayo. Why did you come to Kuwait? <laughs> Dr. Maria is the latest addition in Kuwait. <laughs> the word of God says, do not store up, do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth where the moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. Rather, but lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. These are the words of Jesus. Don't store up. Don't lay up for yourself treasure. It doesn't mean you should not have treasures. You should have treasures. There are treasures you should have. Perfect. Absolutely no problem. In fact, the scripture says you should store inheritance for your children and for your children's children. You should have enough to give your grandchildren. When you write a will, please write your grandchildren's name also. Right? So you should have that. That's, what, that's also scriptural. But don't store up for yourself everything for yourself. My, 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 my. Everything is mine and you hold on to it. You don't give anybody. No. You have to let it go. You have to give to others. So you need to give, that's for sure. So it's not wrong to get, but if you hold on to it, that's wrong. You get to give. You get to give. You come here, you work, you make money, but remember, don't store up everything for yourself. Give. Store up for heaven. When you store up treasure, when you spend time with God for things of God, you are storing up treasure. That's what Jesus said. Lay up for yourself treasures in heaven. You can and you have to do it. Guys, please start storing up treasures in heaven. I know you have a couple of crores back home in India. I know that. Please don't disclose how much you have also. How much do you have in heaven? How much have you stored in heaven? That depends on the time you spend for God. It depends on how much you invested in souls. It depends on how much you spend in church and other things, for godly things, spiritual things. Store up, guys. Store up. It's a warning for you. Don't reach 
Don't be a pauper in heaven. Don't be a pauper in heaven. You might, as the scripture says, you might be poor, yet you can be rich. Yes? The widow who came to the treasury and dropped one coin, Jesus looked at her and said, she has given more than all the others. The others were like, you know, when you drop the coins, you hear the sound in the treasury box. Like, when the coins fall into the box, you hear the sound, like that, the coins falling. The Pharisees and the scribes are listening and seeing how much people are putting. Because the more the sound, more money is there. And then one lady comes and puts one drop, ting, one sound. But Jesus looks and says, she has given more than all the others. She has given more. So when she has given more, she has stored up more in heaven than what the others have done. She did. So let us use every opportunity available to invest in things that are more important, which will not die. I'm going to close with this verse. Second Corinthians, which Paul is right. So far we were talking about Peter uh, writing to the church. But let's look at what Paul is writing to Corinthians in a similar way. Second Corinthians 4, 16 to 18. So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. Look at this oxymoron again. Outer self, wasting. Inner self, renewed. Both happening side by side. For this light, momentary afflictions is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond comparison. So you have again an affliction and a glory happening side by side. Verse 18. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. Amen. This is look good. This is very interesting. We look to the things that are unseen. That's very strange. Right? It's, a, it's a big oxymoron here. Look for the things that cannot be seen. We always teach our children, didn't you see that? Look before you cross the road. Can't you see it? The question is there, right there. Didn't you study it? Look, it's there. But here Paul is writing, telling, look for the things that cannot be seen. Look, this is like strange. I mean, I'm looking, I can't see anything. How do you expect me to see what is not seen? Is this stupid to say, see, look for the things that are not seen? I can't see the things that are seen. I mean, sometimes, mostly. <laughs> How can I see the things that are not seen? But Paul, Pete, Paul is writing here, look beyond that. There is a world, there is a dimension beyond what you can see. By the way, your seeing your sight is basically a frequency wave from certain herds to certain herds. The red to violet, that's all you can see. What is beyond on the spectrum, you can't see. But in your spiritual realm, you can sense and see things. With the Holy Spirit, you can do that. So Paul is encouraging here, look, as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen, the inheritance, for the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Everything that you see here is going to perish. It's going to walk, go. But what is not seen is going to last forever. So let us use every energy we have. Let us focus on the things that are not seen. On the inheritance which is undefilable, unpermeable, uh, undefiled, you know, it cannot be spoiled, it cannot decay, that kind of inheritance, let's look at. Let's turn our eyes away from Rome. Enough of Rome. Rome is roaming, and Rome is roaming. Rome is roaming, and it'll keep roaming around. But that's enough of Rome. It, it burned down, you lost the property, fine. Grieve for some time. Like Paul and Peter both said, you, you can grieve for, the momentary grief, you can grieve for some time. But Close the chapter, look forward to the future inheritance, the unseen inheritance that God has prepared for us, where He has kept especially for us. Amen? Who wants to be neighbors with me in heaven? Good. I'll be myself. <laughs> We're all going to have houses there, right? Uh, I hope you guys are near. You know, we, can, we can still see each other high here, you know. <laughs> Uh, Jesus, this is, you know, we used to do church together. It's like as if Jesus didn't know, you know, <laughs> talk about it. Uh, but it'll be fun to be there. Hi, long time no see. Where were you? Eternity. What are you doing? Roaming. <laughs> Roaming the ends of the world. The new Jerusalem. 
But the New Jerusalem is three dimensional, by the way. Your elevators will go left, right, up, and down. That kind of elevators, which will go in multi direction. The city is like a cube, right? So elevators will go different directions. Anyway, if you start imagining what is in the Revelation, you will be mind blow boggled. It's so beautiful. It's so beautiful. That's inheritance he's careful. And God is there with us at that time. No sin, no dying, no death, no humid weather, no pain. No coronavirus. No need to study also. Hallelujah. <laughs> Children, no need to study also. <laughs> All of you passed. <laughs> but that's heaven for us. Inheritance stored for us. Amen. So in times of trouble, what do you do? In times of trouble, don't think of what is lost in Rome. Think of the future. Think of what is in store for us in the future. The inheritance. The hope in times of trouble. Amen?